Okay, record. We are recording. It is Sunday, August 12, 2018. And this is the um, eighth and final session of our storytelling workshop. It, I guess we started in June or July, June to August. And um, uh, now I'm, I'm going to lead, lead us through the, uh, a warm-up process, uh, and then we'll, we'll hear and discuss stories. So, um, uh, you know, as, I, as I've mentioned, there are many ways to do this kind of warm-up. What I'm doing is just suggestions. Please, um, you know, uh, uh, modify it for, for your own use, depending on if you're working with children or adults or anyway. So first, it's always good to take a deep breath. In and out. A few deep breaths. Either through your mouth or through your nose, as you like. And then um, we'll, we'll do this um, vocal uh, warm up, this um, uh, above your stomach, there's this muscle called the diaphragm. And what you want to do, you want to put your right hand there and feel the contractions when, uh, when we make a sound. Because this is where the, the wind is created and sent upward. The diaphragm squeezes the lungs and air comes up. So uh, what you're going to do is make a vowel sound with an H in front of it, short or long, with or without melody. Uh, and the point is not to be loud, it's just to feel the contraction and let the sound resonate inside your, your body. So, um, ha, ha, hey, hey, ha, 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 ha. oh, oh. Hey. hey, ha, 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 hey, hey, hey. Can anyone feel the, uh, that, that muscle contracting? Ho, ho, ho. Ha, ha. Hey, hey. Hey, 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 hey. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Ho, 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 ho. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, Ah, hey, 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 let your spine curve and then breathe in. As you come up, you're totally up and straight and full. Again, forward as you breathe out and curve. And up and full. And again, out, breathe out as you twist gently to the left. And each time you twist, breathe out. Try to twist as much as you can. Let your arms just hang. Let them, let them just hang. Limp. Breathe out as you twist slowly. Make sure you don't knock anyone next to you. As you come forward, breathe in. As you bounce left, breathe out. Forward, breathe in. And now the other side. Bounce right as you breathe out. Why don't you try going all the way from the right and breathe out. Come all the way to the left. Slowly go from one side all the way to the other side all the way. With a, with a breath each time. Good. 
So you're really twisting your torso. I don't think you can hurt yourself doing that. I don't think you can sprain your torso or pull a muscle. Um, okay, and now um, one arm up and over your head and breathe out as the arm comes over. Breathe out. Really extend your rib cage. And that arm down, other arm up and over your head and breathe out. Both arms up and gently let them swing down, forward, backward, forward, backward. And now this is really tough to do in a little conference window, but um, uh, just follow my uh, movements. This is called mirroring. And the whole group can mirror one person, or you can do it in pairs. You can look into <laughs> one person's eyes and um, uh, do what the other person is doing. One person can lead, then the other person can lead. But we are doing this in a group now. Um, okay, I'm changing it. I'm letting my arms go down, and I'm just, um, uh, going like this around and around from my, uh, from my hips. And now I'm going forward, backward with the breath, I'm breathing out. This forward and backward is especially important in a video conference because you're withdrawing away from your, your, your distant partner, then you're coming close to your distant partner. It's even more uh, striking than if you do this in person. Okay, uh, does anyone else want to uh, uh, suggest a movement? Somebody else do a movement and we'll all follow. But don't stop. You have to keep with the previous movement until the new movement comes. Okay, Vani is going side to side. Hey, Ma, well, I don't see you moving. <laughs> Is she frozen? Okay, well, what to, what to do? Okay, uh, any other change? Anna Perna is also frozen. Okay, maybe that, that's uh, enough of that. So now uh, let's do some um, emotions. Uh, oh, and before that, we'll do some animal sounds. If you're just working with, with adults, you might want to skip the animal sounds, uh, but, um, but let's do the animal sounds. And as mentioned, every animal sound is, a, um, is an emotion or a personality trait that we project onto animals, but they're really aspects of the human personality. So, uh, okay, roar. Roar. Ah. Annapurna, are you, are you ro roaring? Are you, you afraid? <coughs> hey, Ma, let us see a roar. <laughs> okay, next. Um. <laughs> kind of a, kind of a, a whimper. A whimper sound. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, ma. 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 Okay. And as as I've mentioned, when you're working with these sounds and movements and stories. Well, the, the classic thing to do is to combine, combine the animal sound with human speech, whether it's English or Tamil or Bengali or whatever. Uh, yeah. Okay, now just emotions. Oh! 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 Oh, oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. 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 no! no! Yes! Yes! I did! 
did it. I did it. You did it. You did it. No, but I cannot do it. No, but I cannot do it. You can do it. You can do it. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. Can you do it? Can you do it? You can do it. You can do it. Let me see you do it. Let me see you do it. I don't believe you can do it. I don't believe you can do it. Wow, you did it. Wow, you did it. How'd you do it? How'd you do it? I can't believe you did it. Can you show me how to do it? I can't show you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Ooh, that's disgusting. Ooh. No, no, I don't want it like that. Please don't do it like that. Please don't do that. Please change it. Please change it. Oh, you changed it. Oh, you Th changed it. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. So you <laughs> see how these emotions can turn into, um, they really can be just attitudes and uh, it can turn into a skit because uh, one emotion will lead to the reaction of another emotion. And before you know it, you have a conversation. It can be part of a story. So, um, Prithika, if you lead uh, a client in an activity like this, first of all, they'll, they'll think you're very silly, yeah. right? They might <laughs> laugh at you, but I yeah. uh, have a feeling they might forget to stutter. Yeah. So see we if you can... Things also. Hmm? We have sillier things, like we have... And stuff. You have to make them do things like and mm -hmm. stuff. So this is probably less silly compared to all of that. Yes, that is a famous um, activity for um, yeah. uh, speech vocalizing. It's, uh, yeah. it's sometimes called a horse laugh. But what it is, everyone do it, but be careful. You're going to spray spit. <laughs> you inevitably... No, I, I used to, I used to doing it. So. But okay, try to do it without yeah. spraying too much spit. But it's this. It's <laughs> no, I'm doing the lip trill. Just the lips. I'm just doing well, uh, everybody do it in your own style. Yeah. But it is, a, it is a very popular globally exercise on drama coaches and speech coaches. Yeah. It's a voice focusing exercise. Voice and also the muscles of the lips. Mm -hmm. You can only do it if you can lips are relaxed. Otherwise, you won't be able to do it. If you keep can, your lips tense, you can't do it. Yeah, I know, you have to relax. Vani, can you do it? Yeah, you did it. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Try it alone. It's the kind of thing you have to practice and alone. We do um, pitch quiet and stuff on them. We do things like... Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so, um, so there we did our our warm-up and it's it's recorded so you can go back and and look at this and um, modify it uh, to your heart's content uh, Hema has gone but uh, hopefully she'll she'll come back uh, okay so now who's going to who's going to begin yes Bonnie uh, okay uh, I'm gonna uh, shall I unmute you or you again? okay and I'll mute myself go ahead this is a story which actually happened. Or I would want you to believe that this happened. <coughs> At the time, we had occasions. I was still in my teenage. We all went to our grandmother's house. All my cousins, near ones, far ones, distant ones, people even from other cities and states came. We all had a get together. From Christmas to board adults, everyone was gathered together. And we were having fun. There were kids. These kids were playing around and we cousins, we were chit-chatting. 
Suddenly, one kid, he was about seven years old, Nishant, he said, You know what I did? There was a fundraiser in our school. I donated 100 rupees from my own pocket money. Mind you, I didn't ask my dad or mom. That was what I had saved from what my relatives gave me when they visited me. I donated 100 rupees for the school uh, fundraiser. That was to help other poor children to buy books. And then Niharika, who was younger than Nishan, probably five or six years old said, That is nothing Nishan. I am much better than you. You know, every week I give 10 rupees to the house helper's uh, child. We both play together. Every day I give her, every week I give her 10 rupees to buy a chocolate. Now tell me, you are better or I am better? I give every week. You just gave only once 100 rupees. And thus they started squabbling. The other kids also joined in and they were also shouting, I am better, I gave this, you gave that. That's it. A lot of chaos. All this we were listening and we were eavesdropping. And then came my grandmother. She asked us all of us to sit in a semicircle. She put a chair and she sat down. Okay kids, okay adults, okay teenagers. Now I am going to tell you something. You tell me Nishant, who is your favorite god? And Nishant was thinking, I like Lord Ganesha because he, he loves food. He loves eating all modakas and sweets and snacks. So I love, I love Ganesha. And she asked, Preeti, who is your favorite god? Preeti said, I love Lord Krishna. You know, he's so kind to the animals. Just if he plays the flute, all of them are mesmerized. So I love Lord Krishna. Okay, okay, children. Now I will tell you a story. Uh, and how will it be if Lord Krishna is there in this story? And all of us were interested. What story grandmom is going to tell us? And then she started. Once, Krishna and Arjuna were walking from one village to another. Arjuna was thinking, I know I have the greatest and best friend. Krishna is there as my mentor. I know he's omniscient, omnipotent and always there for me. But I have this nagging feeling. Why does, I, why does he always take Karna's name when it comes to being the great donor? You know, the role model for all danas or generosity. Why doesn't he take my name? My example, I should really ask my best friend why he does this. And suddenly he stops. And Arjuna asks, Krishna, there is a thought that is bothering me. Can I, can I, can I ask you? I mean, please don't mind, please. Krishna has a hint of a smile playing on his lips. You can anytime ask Arjuna, I'm your best friend. Go ahead. And Arjuna says, I, I know you are there for me, Krishna, but, but why do you take Karna's name as the best for all kinds of danas? I can prove it that I can be better than him. And Krishna is silent. Okay, Arjuna, sure. I'll give you one simple task. And suddenly, they just look this side and that side. There are a lot of trees, bushes, the mountains and Krishna looks he snaps his fingers the two mountains become shimmering golden mountains in a jiffy Arjuna stands there transfixed looking at all the glittering gold but ask Arjuna you have to donate every last bit of gold from these two mountains however you donate it's up that's simple. Krishna thinks I cannot give a gold. I will prove my point to Krishna. And he goes walking to the village. He gathers all the villagers at the foot of the golden mountains. And he announces, I am not. And I have come here to donate gold. All of you please stand in a line and I will give away the gold. And as the people started standing in lines, there were surprised whispers. Oh wow, somebody is giving us. Somebody is being generous. And Arjuna started digging and digging. He collected the gold as he was digging. And the first person who received it said, 
Oh mighty Arjuna, you are so generous. You have a heart of gold. You are being so kind on us simple village folks. We are in poverty and with this, you have transformed our lives. And Arjuna felt really glad. Then came an old woman. She almost touched Arjuna's feet. Thank you, Arjuna. With this, I can afford for the treatment of my old husband, ailing husband. And there came a kid. You are the greatest. Uh, you are my hero because like I can buy all my books and my toys. We couldn't afford all this. As people began hailing his praises, Arjuna's chest swelled with pride. There it is. I really hope Krishna is watching all this. And there Krishna was a mute spectator. Arjuna went on digging and digging and digging. And it was a small village. He came on distributing all the gold. But the people who received the gold again came back in lines because still the golden mountains were in diminishing any bit. Now they only said, thank you, thank you Arjuna, thank you, thank you. Suddenly he started feeling, oh, they are not singing the praises as they did a few hours ago. Okay, but I have to finish my task. And he goes on digging and toiling and toiling. But even after two continuous days and nights, the two golden mountains did not reduce any bit. I cannot go on like this. He comes to Krishna. Krishna, I will definitely donate all this gold, but please give me some rest. I am extremely so Please. And Krishna said, Okay, Arjuna, no problem. Come here and sit in the shade of this tree. Now let me give this task to Karna. In the meanwhile, Okay, Krishna, okay. And he sends for Karna. Karna comes. And Krishna says, Karna, you have to donate these two golden mountains. Mind you, you have to donate every last bit of gold from these mountains. Karna says, okay, Krishna, okay. And he goes. Now, Arjuna is really curious what Karna will do. And there, he calls the villagers. People of this village, these two golden mountains are yours. You can do as and what, how you wish to do with this gold. And Karna silently walks away. That's it. Now, Arjuna is perplexed. He has a thousand thoughts running in his mind. Why did I think of this? I thought Karna would be working hard like me, digging the gold and giving it away. What is this? Did I prove my point? And then Krishna had that same hint of smile playing on his lips. Before Krishna said anything, my grandmother stopped the story. She wanted all of us who were gathered to answer what was the difference between the way Arjuna donated and between the way Karna donated. After all of you answer, I will tell what Krishna said. And so, I give the same question to all of you. You can tell us what is the difference between the way Krishna and Arjuna donated and what probably Krishna would have said to Arjuna at the end. That is my story. Oh no, well, but please continue. Ask, see yeah. if you can get any answers. Okay. Uh, Arjuna was expecting people to thank him. He, he was like right there saying, look, I am giving you these things. I am giving you these things. Whereas Karna was like, these are yours. He didn't put himself in front of them. He just said, okay, they're yours. I'm walking away now. Whereas Arjuna was like, look, look at me. I'm giving you these things. Me, Arjuna, I am giving you me. So he wanted people to like acknowledge that he is so generous. Whereas Karna was just like, they're yours. Cool. Anybody else? Anything? What difference could you see in the way they donated? Yeah, so I think Arjuna expected something in return, you know, he was giving gold, but he expected something in uh, return, but Karna's actions, he really wasn't like it. Okay, I, I want to ask, um, why did the, the anything in return? He was uh, just doing what Krishna wanted him to do. Why did the grandmother choose to tell this story to, to the children? Me? Yeah. 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 The grandmother chose to tell this story because the two kids, Nishant and Niharika, were fighting about 
who was greater in mm. donating mm. Mm. so she wanted them to understand it in the form of a story not as a moral science lesson so that's why she chose to tell the story i'm not telling the moral yet or whatever the take away i'm not telling it yet <laughs> yeah yeah okay so that's the key point she she the two children were fighting yes. and she wanted to tell a story that would uh encourage them to 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 not fight so i think somehow you could have made that more clear uh you could have emphasized that the children were fighting the grandmother saw them and she was concerned so she decided to tell them a story then then we would know that the point of the story is to give that is to give that message uh so in this case i think a little bit more of this um uh giving us a hint of what this is all about would would be helpful for us uh any other uh uh thoughts remember my my famous five questions four questions uh what did you like about it any suggestions does it remind you of anything else and then finally uh what your your take away okay any thoughts Uh, Arjuna is a king. I'm sorry, uh, is coming from a family, and Karna is a king. Whenever he does a job, he has to do it organized way. If he gives two mountains to take, take all the mountains, there will definitely be a chaos and fight will go on. He should stand there, distribute it as a leader. He should do that. I feel that. But when he's too generous, giving it take. But I don't think a king should. Um, i feel a king should be organized and do a leadership work like take it do it if not uh, the village people will might get into chaos this is for me this is this amount is for me you take you took little i took lots that no it, it should be evenly distributed right or um, as and what, what need and want is to the people Yeah, the gold was there yes. for the villagers, yes. and he said, "Give it to them." Yes. But by just saying, "There it is, uh -huh. take it. It's for you. Take it." But then, as she says, there are so many people there in the village, and they will all fight over this: who's to take what, and how much. Some people will take more, some will take less. They some will get have less. Smaller problems. Some so, will have bigger yeah. problems. So, so that yes. was not so good idea. Yeah. As uh, and uh, neither was the other person just calling them and just giving them some. That was also not correct. Should have found out. We did more for the needy. The yes. needy should get more because there'll be uh, some people who are better off than the others, and uh, it could have been uh, distributed. Yeah, Karna is getting praised, and Karna is being generous. That's so. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so it's like whatever Karna does. Mm -hmm. He is praised. That is as uh, just as it has been said there in the story. Yeah. But in this case, just saying it's there. You take it. He finishes it in a jiffy. He just gives it away like that. But then, what happens afterwards is uh, is a big question mark. Yes. Yeah. So because yes. you don't know how they are, the villagers are going to uh, distribute this among themselves. He leave that job to them. So that could also cause some problem. So that administration work of Arjuna's is actually a good idea in that sense. The administration organization yeah. allotting is probably actually a good idea in that sense. Yeah, he takes ownership as compared to Karna. Hmm. So okay. giving it equally, I suppose. Yeah. Give an equal amount to each of them, so they don't fight over it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Vani. You know, I think let. Me, Let me do the mute and unmute. You okay. just do the you volume. just do the volume control. Oh. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it was wonderful acting. You were very yeah. engaged. Uh, uh, the the characters had strong motivations and were very uh, um, enthusiastic. Uh, how did you feel about the story? Is there any? Uh, First of all, what was your favorite part of telling it? And then, uh, if you would tell it again, would you make it? Would you change it in any way? Uh, yes, I would take your suggestion that I'll make the foreground a little more clearer, like how the children are fighting about. Even after donating, uh, they are thinking like, "I have been greater, or you have been greater. Who is better?" So the, uh, that's. children so they are fighting and so maybe to uh, tell them without being preachy uh, my grandmother must have told the story 
the part i like the most is uh, uh, where arjuna expects karna to do something else but uh, he is suddenly perplexed because he didn't do anything he said this is there it's yours that's it he didn't even turn back so that is a part where i liked it most where uh, karna is not there for praises he is not expecting anything he gives without reservations so that is the point where i like the most about the story that's what i i, I good about it hmm. and uh, one hmm. more thing where uh, i felt like arjuna was uh, constantly like his against based on the way the people reacted uh, when they were singing his praise he, he was exactly. very happy very happy uh slowly as it dwindled and it just was a mere thank you arjuna was expecting some more gratitude from him then so that was something where i thought arjuna's character portrayal <coughs> stood out <coughs> any anyone else any, any other uh, thoughts about the story or the way she told it I like the lead in from the grandmother story like I like the story within a story format actually you too yeah it was very nice way of combining two stories you know yeah. there's a story within a story yeah 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 I I like it too I just want it to be more uh, distinct yeah you know the uh I I I I find that um more and more what makes interesting storytelling is that uh the listener um kind of uh understands why the story is being told uh what makes a story boring is that we we don't understand why or what or you know somehow we are not um uh we don't get why this is going on that's what that's what makes something boring so it's not about voice modulation it's not about acting it's not about body language uh it's it's you have to uh somehow present the whole thing in such a way that it all makes sense and it's very hard to um explain this and identify this but uh that's what we have to do it uh, a story it should, it should not be too obvious because if it's too obvious then um you know you, there's no point in telling the story you might as well just give the message but if we don't understand what the message is or why the story is being told we we lose interest so somehow in in the middle there uh uh the listener has to have a sense of um wh- why this is going on it's a big it's a challenge to to get that right okay any other thoughts All right then let's go on uh when someone going to tell a a personal experience story mm-hmm. Yes okay why don't you two switch seats yeah Go ahead I just warm up for myself Okay <laughs> Thank you. So I didn't prepare anything but I just want to tell you the story which I shared uh, a day back at a narrative event. Mm-hmm. Uh when I was a child I had a question and a wish. Uh but very recently I got answers for the both uh, for the question and I got my wish granted. So my question was I went to my mom and asked how come you love appa it was arranged marriage for you and how how did you fell in love and uh, as soon as we are born like anna is born i am born as soon as we are born you started loving us how was that somewhere in between your life we came and how come you you know you love what how does love evolves i asked her. Uh, sorry how love happened uh, for you i asked her. then uh, sometime later i must be 11 or 12 years old and i had a newspaper in hand and there was a picture in it a small baby was sleeping on a cozy mattress with the air conditioner on it was an advertisement not for the mattress though for the air conditioner so nothing mattered except for the baby it was so cute so chubby toto sweet little baby it was so i ran to my mom and said 
amma you know very well okay i'm not going to get married at all in my life i think everybody would have told that <laughs> not get married but if you insist me and force me to do if that happens i want a baby like this and i did show that picture to my mom years years later i got married obviously on you know uh no i, I was confused it was arranged and because I, i was confused because i couldn't take the road less travel then now advice overflowed on you and as it, it was a package marriage and uh, i uh, i couldn't take it my marriage so excuse me jo sorry about it my phone is so um where i left yeah marriage. my marriage advice was overflowing that i couldn't take it up but marriage happened so check one marriage done check two get pregnant i got it done by ticked by within months so when i got when i saw that positive sign i you know i i didn't i was not happy i was neither happy nor sad i wasn't excited at the same time i wasn't worried i uh, expressed numbness totally plain blank my no happiness no sad nothing my husband on the contrary was happy and he expressed joy over heights for me it was not like that then people who wished me i would be like mm, thank you yeah <laughs> as if i'm not interested my doctor advised me like enjoy your motherhood every time i go to her she says enjoy your motherhood i'll be like what to enjoy you're sick you're vomiting every month you're getting the increasing of weight and your tummy becomes big and what to enjoy it i i, I literally don't know about it so uh, you know it happened like that then um, exactly 9 uh, months crossed exactly a week before i was admitted i was in my labor ward i must say that store opened its furious door a uh, furious inch and uh, miracle struck out the brain of order and ordinary my child was been whining upon he came and amma ta cutting of first amma ta cutting of first was all i was hearing and uh, you know i was half dead and half alive bewildered i don't know what to do i just kissed him over the pain loveless kiss i didn't know <laughs> i was so bewildered uh, later i was having him in my hand uh, little my baby boy i must say 20 inches long 10 mm-hmm. toes 10 finger you know pink lips huge eyes he was gleaming at me and i was not adoring him i was wondering i'm a mother am i am i a mother i'm not a girl i'm, I'm not a mother i was so much in uh, i was muddled then um, uh, i must confess here that for you all that i didn't love my son the way i meant to like as a mother to a child i mean i didn't feel the connect so i used to see him and ask him what i think that why is that i'm not feeling that connect with you but as i am brought up in a joint family one thing they teach in joint families be duty be dutiful be responsible do your duty never expect this, uh, anything that is what is what in my mind so i did everything a mother should do i fed him i put him to sleep i learned around 30 and odd rhymes i i i used to have him here in the shoulder the whole night i had sat with sleepless nights i he demanded all my time i gave him everything but at times it was very painful and i was put in postpartum depression and there was a relationship crisis happening in, in the family so both struck me and broke me down but time certainly flies and day by day as he grew i had to engage him all the time like he started crawling he started running so i have to be at the back of him so slowly and slowly i i started playing with him like i smile he smile he laughs i laugh my life was around him uh, slowly i realized how much i'm enjoying his existence he is wiping away all my pain and he's he has brought meaning to my life i could say nothing or do nothing but i should say love evolved unconditional and strong um I, i i and one day i was i played very hard with him and he slept very tired and i looked at him i saw him and i was like cute little chubby 10 fingered 10 10 toes 
and pink lips, huge eyes. He was sleeping on a cozy house with the air conditioner on. There it struck me and I remember that 11 year old girl who asked a, a baby similar to that, exactly the same. He was, believe me or not, he was sleeping on the same posture that baby was sleeping. And that struck me, tears rolled down. Here I have my wish granted and yes, I'm having my love. I love him because I do and I love him because deepest in my heart, in the place where there was nothing before, there is full of love, unconditional and strong. So love just evolves and my wish was granted. And my question, how love happened, I got the, my answer also. Love evolves. Thank you. That's my story. Wonderful. Okay, I think, uh, I think it would be helpful if, uh, if you would have announced the, uh, the title of the story at the beginning. That this story is about how, how does love grow? Because then we'd really know, uh, you know, what is the point, and we'd know what to, to look for. Um, now, when you first began, you asked your mother, what did you ask her? How, 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 love, how love happened. First, you should tell us that your mother and father uh, have a very loving relationship. <laughs> uh, because we don't know that they, we don't know that love has, has grown. Uh, so first you have to let us know it's, it's, uh, it's like that. Then you can ask, how, how have you done this? But first we should hear, because I, I thought, is it really? Is it so? Uh, so to avoid that kind of distraction, first you should let us know that, they, that, that, that yeah, it's good. A small, hmm? a small introduction about it. Uh, not just to mention, uh, you know, my mother and father, they, they have a loving relationship. So I asked my mother, how did love grow? Uh, if I just, uh, you know, if I say, I, I saw my mother and I said, how did love grow? <laughs> she, might, she might say, love didn't grow. We don't have that. There are many situations where that happens. I'm sorry to tell you. You know that. She, said me, she asked me, what kind of a question? I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead. So when, that, you, when I asked my mom, she said, she said, told me, what kind of a question is this? I don't want to ask. Answer that. <laughs> mm. the, there's a, uh, a, a, a musical theater play called Fiddler on the Roof, and one of the great songs in it, uh, the husband and wife, this is about Jewish people living in Russia a uh, hundred years ago, and they also had arranged marriages. So, um, you know, this couple, they have been married for 30 years, but uh, suddenly the, uh, the husband, uh, he's, uh, he's, um, delivering, he's delivering milk every day. So it's a poor family. But uh, he asks her, um, Goldie, do you love me? And then, she, then the song begins. She says, do I love you? For 25 years I've washed your clothes, had your children, <laughs> shared your bed. After 25 years, why, why do you bother to ask me? Why, why, why you love me? And he says, no, 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 Goldie, I want to know, do you love me? And then finally she says, yes. But it's a, it's a, very, it's a very charming song. Uh, okay, anybody else, any feedback on the story? Go ask, ask them the uh, ask them these four questions. Along with you in the story. Something you like? Suggestions? How come you had no emotions at all? <laughs> because much much later in life you you sort of get that feeling of no, love and uh, how yeah. come earlier you did not have this but to you were a child who was loved. Yeah. But you did not have. Uh, no, any I couldn't feel the connect with my Most son. Postpartum depression is a thing though. Huh? Yes. Postpartum Post depression is heard on, I suppose. You would know better, I suppose, with the medical, more of a medical background ish. Yes, that that's happens true. also. That's true. Yeah. Something yeah. about oxytocin, not enough, something else. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Because of the hormonal changes, uh -huh. it's not necessary that everyone uh, who so has delivered a baby, not everyone. At first, I didn't want to get married. 
That's why I wanted to do something else before I get married. I couldn't do that. So that was in my mind. So that is the main reason. Yeah, and I didn't want to have a child immediately after marriage. Mm. I didn't plan for it. Actually, I took life as what it brings to me because of that commotion happened before marriage. I took that decision. But when well, when I got pregnant, I was not ready for that. I I thought that I couldn't do that. I I couldn't do that. So that led me to that part. I think you were not like, happy no, about it. Yes, I was not happy. I I what I felt from her story is, as she said very correctly, she said. uh if if a person has finished a girl or a boy no matter if they have finished a graduation or college yeah. next thing immediately when, when is a job a job first is a job next if you have marriage. a job it is settled when are you getting married then again there will be this clock ticking the mm-hmm. biological clock uh, so marriage exactly. at least by 25 to 28 by 30 one kid one kid ha huh. so like when they come to give bouquets <clears throat> at the reception they'll be asking so when are you going to tell the good news <laughs> and we are like uh, we've just met yeah you know at the stage only we met <laughs> in the reception all we've met so please give us some time and that doesn't stop there after the yeah. first child they'll be like uh, when will you give a baby brother or a baby yeah. sister so the next one <laughs> exactly so this is yeah. like the thick list very correctly she told you have to keep picking <laughs> just yeah. for the sake of others so my she was ended uh, up in that made some small clothes for my child before he was born mm. like small getting ready with all those things she had mm. all those in a cupboard very safe and i asked her why you are having this throw this out she said i what about if next baby comes i should be ready with this i can't make it again i was like what how can you decide that i have to decide for that <laughs> he's just one one year <laughs> Actually, Even if it is six years or five years after, she wants that stock be ready for the next. <laughs> But girls are not men. I'm I'm ready. not blaming her, but she's doing her part correctly. That's mm-hmm. she's being more loving and caring and being responsible, and she's very careful not to do wrong from her side. So she's getting ready for it. <laughs> But I guess all parents are like that. Yes. The moment the child, uh, the girl, it educates herself and she studies, some will work, some may not work also. But yeah. then they feel okay. You now she's ready for marriage. So their next job is to project is to look for they a get thing. They get a thing in front of them. Goes on. Like Take care of them. But what this story tells us is that we should be ready for marriage. Yes. <laughs> She should have felt, "Oh, okay, I have accomplished whatever I wanted to do, and now I am ready to settle <laughs> down, and I want to get married, and things like that." That would have helped her a lot. Otherwise, she was most very unhappy throughout. That's the feeling we get, isn't it? Whether it was before or after. Not unhappy. I was like, not <laughs> confused. I was like, yes, we'll take it. We'll not take it. Taking it, how to lead it? Yes. I was always thinking about. It. That's fine. Then I have to. Uh, I mine was arranged, so I have to. You know, with my husband, I have to start from the first. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Yeah, fine. That process has to go on. But this came very naturally to the generation before. It is yeah. now we are blabbering and you know very uh, talking too much about it. But before generation, they took it naturally. And I don't know how they, they did that. That is great. Doctor Eric is very amused because I know. I mean, it doesn't happen. <laughs> It's only here in India, probably more in uh, South India now, that uh, parents almost have that uh, forceful thing. Like, protective. This has to happen within this time. This has to happen. No, but there you're given freedom of choice, and you you can the new field you can do it. You are allowed to do it. It's not forced upon you. Am I right? That is very. Otherwise, you won't. The, the um, uh, arranged marriage is is not unique to India. As I just said, uh, Jewish people in in Russia uh, uh, had arranged marriages, and that's where my people are from. I'm a I'm a Russian Jew. Uh, my my family moved from Russia uh, to America a hundred years ago. uh and um and now i've moved to india 
uh, I'm not a religious person, but um, uh, anyway, my own roots are in, um, uh, for four or five hundred years, my, my family on both sides lived in a small village in Russia, uh, different villages, and uh, they had arranged marriages. So uh, don't think it's only India. Uh, there was a famous profession in those places, uh, a matchmaker, a lady, usually she would have a little book and she would uh, keep track of, uh, of, of who was eligible and she would, would, you have that in India too, a matchmaker? Uh, yeah. Also, also in that play, Fiddler on the Roof, I mentioned there's a song, the three uh, sisters uh, sing, um, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match, find me a fine, catch me a catch, matchmaker, <laughs> matchmaker, look in your book and find me a perfect match for, for father, and I'm, I'm, I'm the wrong key, for father, make him a scholar. For a mother, make him rich as a king. For me, well, I wouldn't holler if he was as handsome as anything. Uh, yeah, in her in her mind. As it turns out, um, one of the one of the daughters rejects the the, the man who um, who her parents uh, find, and the whole traditional culture is breaking down. And actually, many of the members of the village in that play move to America. So that play is really about the end of tradition in, in Russia. And see, that play was made by uh, Jewish people who'd moved to New York, like me, Russian Jews who moved to New York, and they made this play about the old days, nostalgia. This is where we came from. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I... Uh, I, I did not have exactly an arranged marriage, but it, it was not, uh, uh, I, I, when, I, when, when I decided I, I wanted to get married, it was, it was after my, my field work uh, in, in uh, the southern mountains near Pechiparai, near the border with Kerala. I came back to Chennai and um, I decided I, I wanted to settle in Tamil Nadu. So I decided I, sh I should also have a wife in Tamil Nadu. <laughs> so I, I could not use the um, matrimonial websites because they're asking what religion and what caste. I didn't want to talk about that. So I put an ad in the Hindu that uh, 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 a USA man seeks Tamil woman for marriage. The only condition was that she should have a, an interesting career. And uh, luckily, I found Magdalene, who is a psychological counselor. She didn't answer the ad, but we had we had friends in common. Um, so, uh, so that is not it. it was not a, it was not a hundred percent love marriage. I mean, it, it is a love marriage, but uh, it it also had to do with um, it's a cultural marriage because I said I am a USA man. I I I, I want to marry a Tamil woman. You know, no offense, but uh, a woman from any other state of India would not do. <laughs> and she had to speak Tamil uh, to, to help teach me Tamil. So, uh, yeah. So, so that is, it's not a full arranged marriage, but it's not, it, it's, it's not an ordinary <laughs> love marriage. Okay, I don't know why I, I went into all that. But, uh, One more yes, go ahead. One, one more thing I wanted to say is, that even in uh, Australia, in US and all that, if a, if a child grows to be, becomes an adult, he is not allowed to stay with the parents. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He has to move out and live on uh -huh. his own. Yeah. So that is the way the, the bringing is there in many of these places I know. It doesn't happen in India, it doesn't happen in France. Yeah. France is also very family oriented. They like mm -hmm. the family to stay together, but uh, and they don't like anyone to leave. But when uh, in the U.S. and all that, so become a rule that once That's you are eighteen, you must not stay with your parents. You have to live alone. You pay rent until they get their independence, and they start living an independent life. But uh, you're muted. You're muted, Eric. You're muted. Yeah. Now, now with uh, difficult economic conditions in in the USA. Many more young people in their 20s and 30s are continuing to live with their parents because okay. of the economy. And for the first time in history, this new generation uh, will statistically, in general, 
they will make less money than their parents. Yes, yes. Because, uh, yes, because the, the, the jobs, the union jobs are gone. There are fewer and fewer unions. And um, most employment in the USA now is working at McDonald's and Burger King. Yes. Yeah. So the management jobs are, are not so much, and the um, software jobs in, in, in India, uh, and uh, there's less production in the USA, all production is in China. So, um, uh, so it's really a, a cultural crisis for young people now. Many of them have big debts from college, so they graduate from college and they have no choice. They have to go back home. And they they may stay there for ten or more years. It used to be uh, back in my day, uh, you could work and and uh, and study, and you could make enough money that it paid for college. But now college is so expensive, but the the hourly wage is the same. So yeah. You can, you, if you work uh, an ordinary job uh, someplace, it will be a tiny fraction of your, of your college fee. So people graduate college now with a tremendous debt uh, and, and they live back home. So uh, I would like, the, the story that you just told, I would really like to hear it told sometime um, uh, uh, about a woman. You know, for you to take it and okay, it happened to you, but say, this happened to a friend of mine, or this happened to a, a woman. Because as you, as has come out in the conversation, a, a lot of what you experienced is experienced by many, many women. It is a general situation, uh, yeah. especially in India. This thing of, um, do, I, do I get married? Do I have children? What about my career? Do I put my career on hold? It's, it's not just a personal set of decisions it's a it's a social it's a social situation that's universal to to many women especially middle class middle and upper class women here so if you told it in the form she did this she did that it would really bring out that this these are public issues these are social issues it's not just about me it's about this woman who is representing general women so the story would have a different flavor and it would give different ideas if you did it that way. Uh, and then of course you could make little changes in the story if you wanted to bring out different points. It would no longer be tied to your uh, actual uh, uh, circumstances. But uh, okay, you know, I always feel that the, the greatest thing about a story is the ideas and the issues that it brings up and the conversations that it, that it causes. So, uh, so this was, uh, by those criteria, this was a very good story. Yeah. Okay, so now, uh, next. Who is next? Oh yes, any, any other feedback about the story or the way she told it? Right? <laughs> well, okay, then if, if if nobody else gives feedback, then you have to give feedback. Yes. So uh, what, what part of it did you most enjoy telling? Uh, the, uh, the later part, when I started, you know, enjoying my son's existence, that, that part I love the most to tell because I enjoy it every day. <laughs> though it's tiring, though it is, it takes my time, it is enjoying and forgetting things that I, I need not think, I'm engaged, I'm happy, and when I see him smile, it, it brings so much happiness in me. So that part I loved telling. Frankly, I love the story because as uh, Dr. Eric said, it resonates with anyone in general. Yeah. Like these are the confusing thoughts all of, of most of the girls go through, young girls, like what to choose, are we for this? Uh, should we take it as it come, or should we fight our, our way against it? Should we stand out, or should we fit in? So these are thoughts which are like uh, there are there is a depth answer. I think it changes from one person to one person. What our moms could do so effortlessly, 
they are not able to do that. Mm -hmm. They are probably uh, changing our priorities. Yeah. So it is a very personal decision on each family, each person. So yeah, that's what I felt. Anybody can connect to her story. I think parents should be more understanding and uh, they should consult the girl if she's really prepared for marriage before they go ahead with all these things. They can't force it on someone. So that is, they should give them some time. Yeah. But as a parent myself uh, of a, <laughs> of a, a, a child, a, a girl who's now 11, but she's acting already like a teenager, um, it has all reminded me that uh, from the parent's point of view, we want our child to have security. We want to make sure she's, uh, uh, it's, it's good if she learns some kind of craft or some sort of um, skill or, or some, gets expertise in, in some field where she can make a living uh, if she wants to. And, um, and then, you know, a large part of, of marriage, uh, and especially arranged marriage, is that it's an economic partnership not just between two individuals, but two families. So uh, the, the parents' the big concern is, you know, uh, I want my child to be secure and, and happy. If, if my child says, uh, you know, if, 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 if we have a child who says they're, they're homosexual or transgender, we're horrified, we're terrified because we don't know if they'll have a life, if they'll have a community, if they'll have any security. Uh, because we don't know, at least I don't know that subculture. Uh, uh, so likewise, if, if, I, if I see my, my daughter is going with someone and that person doesn't seem to be stable, doesn't seem to be, have a good future, that will really cause a lot of tension. Because, you know, after I'm gone, after my wife is gone, that child has to somehow support herself uh, with, a, with a partner. And if the partner does not seem sufficient, on some level, uh, that's yeah. that, that's the real uh, driving anxiety, I think, of of a parent, at exactly. least from, from my own my own imagination and, and experience. There are a lot of cases in many families. Go ahead. There are a lot of cases in many families that this thing happens. Parents, uh, some of them like they want them to get well educated, uh, you know, have a good job. They should be independent financially. It's always good, and uh, then. Select a partner, he is almost of the same status or better than them. Mm -hmm. So they feel yeah. that they'll have a better life. <coughs> but it always does yeah. not happen. They might marry someone <laughs> who, who the parents don't approve of. They may like someone who yeah. they don't approve of. And some cases they are forced to accept. It happens. Yeah. I want to say something here. I mean, this is totally my personal opinion. Yes, parents do have that concern like what life would be for them. They are not going to be there supporting them forever. Exactly. How will they survive this world? It is not really welcoming. Sometimes the world is really a roller coaster ride with all it bumps and yeah, it throws things at you when you least expect. So sometimes what I feel is if parents are overprotective, they are almost subconsciously what they are doing is they are weakening the children. Yeah. Sometimes they should allow the, the children, children, then only they learn endurance, strength, True. how to face situations. True. And moreover, yes, sir and uh, Janet also mentioned something that parents are concerned about the financial securities. But I know some of my own friends who have got married in really affluent families, uh, like uh, very well to do, highly educated in the greatest <laughs> jobs. They're not happy. Okay. Some of them, some of them, they're not happy. They're not happy in the relationship. So it, it changes from each other. If there is no love and warmth in the marriage, then only financial security or the status is not going to help. Probably if you don't live in a bungalow, if you live in a 2 BHK flat with probably even 40,000 income and you're happy, I think it matters a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. not only financial, yes. that, uh, but that is the basic yeah. yeah. You know, also have to live person. comfortably afterwards. So right. that naturally any parent will want that yes. to happen. But you should also have that understanding with your partner. So they say marriage is a gamble. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> we should be lucky. You never know yeah. what happened. Some are very lucky, some are very unlucky. No, this is just my personal uh, yeah. feeling. That's yeah. all. <laughs> okay. In, uh, yeah. in the USA, we have an expression if you. If you marry somebody who has more money than you, 
It's called marrying up. Yeah. Do you have that expression here? Yes. Yes, yes. Very good. Uh, but as, as has been said, uh, that, that's not the only factor. That should not be the only factor in yeah. the decision making process. Okay. Uh, somebody else, tell a story. Okay, I'll tell a story, but um, oh, well, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I am. I I've changed my mind. I'm not telling the epic anymore. I'm sort of going with the times, and I'm going to tell a story about a woman. Well, a girl. I should say that a girl. Um, this girl had. She was just finishing up. She. This girl lived in India, and she was just finishing up her uh, her bachelor's degree. And her plan, she had high goals in life. She wanted to do her master's degree. Then she wanted to do a doctorate. She wanted to do a PhD. She wanted to get the doctor title without going for medicine because she didn't want medicine. So this girl, she, and she wanted to do her master's degree abroad because that is a fad in these days. So uh, she wanted to do her master's degree abroad. So basically she wanted to go to the US. And so her entire final year, this girl slogged a lot. She wrote her GREs, she wrote, she studied, studied for TOEFL, she wrote, she wrote a bunch of essays, she did, made a bunch of applications, and she applied to a bunch of colleges. And how she applied was she applied to a few low-ranking colleges and just one high-ranking college, just for the heck of it. And, but uh, I'll give you a timeline. It was around um, near the end of her final year when she applied. And almost a month away from finishing her final year, she got her um, results for all her applications. She had been rejected by every single college except for the highest ranking one, where she got an acceptance letter. Unfortunately, they weren't providing her funding because Trump had happened and he cut funding. So uh, they weren't providing her funding. So she was um, she got this acceptance letter one night. It was a night in March. The university saying, when accepted, you have to pay $150,000 of tuition for two years. And so she, in her head, she, she thought that it's okay. She, can, she thought she could manage money. However, she thought she could pay off loans because this was a prestigious university. It was a top third, I think. It was a top third. And she thought she could pay off her loans. So she went completely into it. And she decided that come hell or high water, she was going to go to this university. And when she told her parents, they didn't, they didn't forbid her as such, but they were a little weary because they were also worrying about her financial security. So they were, they told her, listen, child, um, there's going to be a lot of loans if you do this, and you're going to end up paying loans for the next 20 years of your life if you do this. So just think about it. But in her head, she, want, she was like, this is the most prestigious university out there. So I want to do this. So her parents said, okay, fine. So now this girl was also at the marriageable age, as uh, Indian parents put it, but her parents had not start, had not put her out as available yet. But <coughs> in happenstance, what happened one day, around a week after the acceptance letter came, and she'd been having a few um, turbulent talks, not fights, but turbulent talks with her parents about whether she should really take this up or not. Um, her, her mother got a call from a distant extended relative saying, um, listen, isn't your daughter 22 years old? We'd like to um, propose marriage for our son who's living in the US. So this girl's mother, she, she didn't want to take any decisions about consulting her daughter. So uh, when, the, when the girl came home, the mother, she came home from college and the, the mother said, listen, you've got a marriage proposal. What do you want to do? The girl told her, now the girl was still thinking, university, university, university. So the girl was like, I don't know. Do they know that I want to study? So this woman called, so while the girl was sitting there, she uh, listened as her mother called the, called that family back and she told them, listen, my the, the daughter wants to study in this particular university in, a, in this particular state. And the extended, the other family, they were actually pretty, they seemed okay. They were like, oh, okay, she wants to study. Okay, perfect. We have relatives there. We could even um, fund her studies there. So the mother was still leery because she hadn't prepared for her daughter's wedding and all, but and the girl had not thought about marriage before. But right now, the girl was thinking university, university, university. So the girl was thinking, hmm, why not? Let me consider this. It's okay. It's a means to an end. So I'll consider this. It's okay. Then, so then there were a few more uh, back and forth talks between the girl's family and the other family. They asked the girl's family to send a picture. 
and they uh, and so the girl's mother asked them to send a picture back. But then they were like, listen, our son is not very good looking. He's a little short. He's a little chubby. He's a little dark skin. So the mother asked the girl. She was like, okay, listen, this guy. She told she relayed the entire thing to the girl. And the girl said, I am not that immature to be older to be prejudiced based on looks. As long as um, I can get along with this person, I like to meet this person before I make any decision. So the woman relayed this back. The girl's mother relayed this back to the family. And again, the other family said, but your daughter is so young. How can she take such a decision? But, and, but the mother vouched for her daughter, saying, no, my daughter is mature enough. Uh, she would like to meet your son, and, that's, and we'll base a decision based on that. So the other family was also pretty okay with it. They said, listen, why don't you come over? Let's just talk. The families, not the girl. They, they left the girl at home on particular Sunday, and the girl's parents went and met the other uh, the, the boy's parents, and they had a nice extended discussion where the, the girl's parents were very happy with them. They, they were apparently very cordial, very hospitable. And, but they told, but they said that the boy had already had two rejections based on his looks. And both those rejections were by very young um, uh, prospective guys, like 22, 23 years old. So they were, so they said, we think your daughter is not mature enough. Why we want to come and see your daughter. Can we come and see your daughter? Say this Wednesday. This girl's mother said, no, I, I don't want to subject her to the thing, the girl seeing ceremony type thing. I want it to be her decision and decide this Wednesday is actually my daughter's birthday. She may be going out with friends or something. So I don't want to do this. So, uh, but and they said, okay, fine. And they came back. They came back and while the mother was doing all of this talk with the extended, with this other family, the girl's father was not doing very much. He was doing something else. And the girl didn't know what she, what he was doing. The girl's mother didn't really know what he was doing. He wasn't opening up. He was on the computer. He was doing something. And after, so after this particular day, the Sunday, they came back and the girl asked her mother, what happened? What did they do? And the mother said, no, they're very nice. They're very cordial. They said the son is going to come in 10 days to meet them, but they want to meet you. They wanted to come and meet you this Wednesday, but I told them no. The next day, the girl's mother called them and asked, uh, what did you think? Do you, are you, uh, are you going to consider this? And they said, no, no, um, we wanted to come and meet your daughter, but you said no. I think maybe we should, you, you, you listen, you just send you, let your daughter study there. You can send your daughter to study. Let them meet. The girl was studying, wanted to study in a different state and the place where the, the this boy was working was a completely different state on the other coast. Let them meet and then let's see. Let's figure things out. Now by this time, so now it was a flop. But by this time, the girl had also realized that her plans for this, her financial plans for this university were not really feasible. Because, until, because in the beginning, she had all these high hopes of loan. Then she thought, okay, if I get married, maybe I can do this. But then she realized that, no, it's, it's going to be too much. So the girl, she was a little disappointed, but she realized, okay, it's okay. I'll just figure out whichever uh, university I did my bachelor's in, I'll just do my uh, master's there, it's okay, whatever. But then one day, so uh, throughout all of this, so the girl has gone through this thing where she wanted to go abroad. Then she thought, okay, let me at least get married and go abroad. And then she decided, no, it's not feasible at all. But then she suddenly gets a, got an email the next week after that from a central government institute in India, the most prestigious institute for um, the particular course she was doing with a entrance exam hall ticket. Now, she hadn't applied to this university at all because she, this particular university, it was a, it's a central government, it was a central government institute and she thought she wouldn't get in. But her father apparently applied. And to appease her father, she wrote the exam also, but she had mentally prepared herself that I'm going to do my uh, master's in this particular college where I did my bachelor's only. And she wrote the exam and to her absolute surprise, she actually got in in a very high rank in this government institute with the highlight being that she got into the merit quota where she paid much, much less than, than even if she did her college in any other place within India itself. And when she met her classmates, everyone had been studying for years for this exam and she hadn't studied at all. So then she realized that after hardly a month ago, I was worrying so much about money. Now I'm, go I'm going to a prestigious college in India without worrying about money. So that worked out in her favor and she, she decided that, okay, fate sometimes does have good things in store for her. That girl is me. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> this entire thing took place over a month. <coughs> <laughs>
Okay, you Thank told you. it. You told it with with full uh, conviction and um, and yeah. and good uh, dialogue. Uh, I think everyone noticed when when you went into dialogue, uh, our ears perked up, and we paid special attention when there was one character speaking to another. Um, the story, as a story, it needs a little focusing. Yeah, yeah. I had not, to yeah, we, mm -hmm. it, it, again, this thing of shaping material to uh, yeah. give it a title so we know what we're, we're looking for exactly. You know, we know mm -hmm. it's about the decision-making process around education, around marriage, but somehow um, we need to... Uh, the tightness, yeah. We need, you know, this is saying, I might have mentioned it before, when you're uh, dating someone, you call up the person and you say, uh, let's go on a date. If the person says where we're going to go, uh, you, should, you should hang up. <laughs> because it doesn't matter where we're going to go. We're just going to go. Uh, but, um, uh, but with telling a story or writing a story, you do have to let your listener know where we're going to go. You can't, you can't expect that your listener just wants mm -hmm. to spend time with you. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, either with a title or a little introduction or yeah. something, uh, mm -hmm. it, needs, it needs to be shaped. Yeah, I hadn't planned this. I'll try to record, it, record this also, maybe share it on WhatsApp perhaps. Because mm -hmm. this just, you know, it came out on its own right now. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. and, and, you know, maybe uh, before you told it, you, you were not sure exactly what was the most important part. A part of the uh, mm -hmm. comp composition process is getting it all out and then uh, mm -hmm. seeing what's there and organizing it uh, uh, to bring out mm -hmm. the central point. But we often don't know what the central point is until we first get it out. This mm -hmm. is true about, yeah. about essay writing especially. Uh, not just story mm -hmm. writing, but you know, if you're writing a research essay, uh, first yeah. of all, you can either get all your ideas out, then you can you can see really what what is uh, in what is in play here, and what is the point that I yeah. want. We often do not yeah. know in advance what is the point that we want to make. Okay, anybody else uh, likes suggestions? Uh, it, uh, I'm sure it reminds all of us about our decision making processes. Yeah. Uh, takeaways, anybody? Yeah, I think it was very nice, very engrossing, uh, Pratika. You know, um, I was listening the entire time to see what happens next. Uh, but yeah, like um, Eric said, yeah. a little tightening, well, but I guess because yeah. it was impromptu, you know, you it was impromptu. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, very good effort, yeah. Uh, Pratika, what was your favorite part? As you were telling it, what what part was the most um, the uh, end? Oh. getting it, getting into the because if I had not planned to get into the university at all. Mm. I hadn't studied for it. I compared to the work that most of my classmates put in, I had not put in any work at all. So mm. getting in here was providence, actually. Mm -hmm. And you, you, what did you study there? Oh, here right now? Yeah. Are, are, are you still in it? Yeah, yeah. I am in the All India Institute of Speech and Hearing in Mysore. Oh, wonderful. It, it's the speech and hearing equivalent of AIMS. So. Fantastic. And I'm studying my master's in speech language pathology. I would have, uh, the acceptance was in Boston University, but it was different. Does it, does it come on? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the speech therapist does it comes under doctorship or something? No, unfortunately, we don't have the doctor title. I like it. It reminded me of uh, something similar like this only. Mm. Like, yeah, it happens. Like, you will be yeah. wishing for this university or this college, yeah. but something totally unexpected happens. Yeah. Maybe for much better much yeah. better show for you. Mm -hmm. This has happened uh, sometimes for me too. Like when I passed my 10th exam, I thought I wanted to get into some other college, but uh, finally <coughs> I got into the college and it turned out for the better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I could connect yeah. with that. You told it very well, as Sir said, so. maybe 
I did it in the end. Yeah. yeah. But you told it on the spot. Because yeah, we started did. with uh, Shivani's exactly. story about life, story, yeah. life decisions. So yeah. you must have reminded you of your own story. Yeah. Actually, when I finished my UG in engineering, I wanted to do MBA in a B school. But uh-huh. because of a particular financial crisis at that moment, uh-huh. I couldn't take it up. So I ended up doing PG in the same college. Okay. And same. Then, most yeah. of my UG classmates are doing their PG in that college. Not very, pe- not very many people got in from my UG college here. Most people who got into PG here were the ones who did their UG here because they've been studying all four years here. Yeah. I also feel that I think we attach a lot of importance for uh, Ivy League universities yeah. or uni- uh, yeah. US universities. Right. Yeah. Universities. Yeah. I think we have a lot of potential here too, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but uh, but yes, we, that that comes with a tag. Just like some people have this IIT, IIM yeah. tag. Just yeah, with I, a tag, they get yeah. so much work done. But we fail to recognize that people who have done the same course in a very ordinary mm-hmm. local college yeah. have equal potential too. Yeah. So yeah. that is like. We attach tags to people, mm. but we have to see them for what talent they have yeah. and not the tag. So I, I thought that is where we yeah. have to change a little as a society. The thing with me was I didn't expect to get in here, not because I didn't think this was a good place. This was high in my priority list, but being a central government college, they have quotas and all, right? Yeah. So in like 80, the first 10 are merit free. Then it, then it's. Uh, uh, OBC, SC, ST. So, with uh, competing against like 300 other people for 10 seats, that too, because I had studied also, I was like, no, I have a chance. In fact, my writing the entrance here was, I thought, okay, I'll write the entrance for this place and base as a baseline, and then I'll study for my UG college's PG entrance so that I'll actually get in there. Ironically, I wrote that entrance, I didn't get as uh, I didn't do quite as well in that entrance as I did here. I wrote it after an accounting year because I paid thousand rupees in application fees <laughs> there. So yeah. <laughs> well, of course, it um, uh, a lot depends on the actual uh, department and the actual professors. Uh, th- that's more important than the the name of the university. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, um, I did my PhD at an Ivy League university in, in the USA, the, the University of Pennsylvania. The, there are seven mm-hmm. Ivy League universities. And uh, I, had a very, I had a very good experience, but um, it is said of the uh, uh, Ivy League universities that um, uh, some people some people get intimidated by the administration. The, the more famous a university is, the yeah. more, sometimes, the more arrogant the administration will act. That's true. That's true. And uh, it is said about the Ivy League universities in America that some people get intimidated by the university and mm-hmm. never recover emotionally. If, if the university does not, uh, you know, does not give them credit, does not give them a degree, or somehow, you know, sometimes conflicts come up with administration. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe 30 years ago, I heard somebody say, some people never recover from the humiliation or the frustration of dealing with a famous university. Um, Fortunately, I I, I handled it okay. Uh, um, I was, you know, some things came up, especially because I finished my degree uh, while I was in India. I did the defense of my dissertation by video conference, a video conference like like this. Uh, So I was organizing the whole thing from the other side of the world, and I had to make sure my professor showed up and and everything, uh, and it it worked out. But um, I always had in mind that somebody said, some people never recover from dealing with uh, the administration of a, a famous university. Fortunately, I survived. Mm-hmm. And I got my degree. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, okay, it's 12 o'clock. So uh, if anyone else was, 
was planning to tell a story. Uh, I apologize. The time has run out. But the good news <laughs> is, uh, uh, I told each of you, uh, I'm available for a 25-minute one-on-one session. Nobody has taken me up so far. I don't know. I will eventually. Good, good. And Hema, I hope, Hema, we, we almost had a meeting last week. I, I hope we have a meeting uh, next week or so. But it is a part of this um, uh, workshop. I, I like to think that I am, uh, I'm like a college professor, and college professors have office hours and uh, meetings by appointment with, with uh, people in the, in the course. So um, please, uh, say we'll, we'll, we'll make a six-month time limit. In the next six months, uh, you, each one of you is welcome to make an appointment with me in person or by, by Zoom and, um, you know, tell me a story, I'll give feedback, or we can just have a general discussion. Um, so, uh, you know, I really want feedback uh, from, from you distant people, Hrithika, Annapurna, Hema, and, and the others, about how this experience was uh, in terms of the technology, in terms of the, uh, the whole video conference process. I also want feedback from, from you three. Uh, I'm almost afraid to ask because, <laughs> because uh, it took us a few weeks to get organized at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Now I, I think we're pretty organized, but it's certainly not as... Um, uh, there are certain limitations uh, that yeah. people here, that, well, all of us, you know, we were not able to get up and move around, for one thing. Yeah. For another thing, um, when you three were, uh, well, most, even now, you cannot, to see each other, you have to look at the screen, right? The, the three people yeah. who are in the room with me, they cannot look each other in the eye, they are all facing the screen and seeing the, each other's face in the screen. So I don't know, is that, was that a, a problem or it's, it's, it's yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, maybe privately, uh, by telephone, by email, or when we have a one-on-one a -on -one meeting, I, I give me feedback. Because uh, I, I know the future, not just for me, but for, for many uh, teachers, uh, trainers, is um, doing this sort of thing. It's, it's much easier if, if the trainer is alone in the room and everyone is connecting by, by video conference. That's simple. But, uh, uh, have a hybrid. but to have a hybrid with people in the room also, and naturally, you know, in Chennai, uh, there will be three, four, five people who want to attend in person. Uh, so the, 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 the challenge is to make it a satisfying experience for, for both the distant people and the present people. So we can talk uh, if, if you have any suggestions to improve it. Uh, uh, so does anyone want to say any, any final words uh, in the workshop? Uh, go ahead. I think this whole idea of a hybrid Zoom and in-person conversation uh, the sole starter must have been me because I'd been behind the serve or like asking because I'm technologically a little challenged and so please can I come and participate in person. So I'm saying I'm grateful that uh, there was an opportunity to come and attend this in person and uh, I didn't find this uh, to be any sort of uh, a discomfort or anything. Yes, initially there were minor glitches about setting it up or projecting it on the wall and uh, the voice, uh, the echo, but that is all like, I, I think it is totally on the sidelines. My main important uh, point from this session is, I think I opened up as a person. We could connect with so many people from so many places on different levels. At the end, we find that we have that basic human connect yeah. intact, whether it's through technology or face to face. So it doesn't matter whether we are in person or on the Zoom conference. Yeah. What matters is the stories that we share and uh, yeah. what uh, emotional bonds they forge for us. You know, I think it was a great session. All these sessions, I mean, the whole uh, season was great for me. And uh, yeah, I, I would like to take part in further any, any other uh, uh, sessions or uh, events 
yeah and i want to stay connected to all of you even those who are not there today yeah. you know, on the zoom uh, i i just really hope all of us stay connected at least on the whatsapp group <laughs> yeah <laughs> I will make a trip to Chennai sometime, not soon, but sometime. Oh, wonderful! Wait, wait, just a second. Go ahead. So kindly inform us of any more sessions that are happening, yeah, so that yeah. we can attend. Oh, you get emails. Yeah, exactly. We want to keep in touch with Dr. Eric. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, on online courses, I, I, I see it more and more, <coughs> and. Um, uh, so, uh, Vani, I'm sure d d d d d it, it won't be too long until you are conducting an online course, either for young people or for uh, uh, soft skills, life skills uh, training. There are many different varieties. Um, sometimes it's called a webinar. Yeah, right. uh, usually yeah. a webinar is just that the speaker is sending audio and video out and the listeners maybe can send back uh, text messages. Uh, but only by by typing, so that is like that is a broadcast, but it's interactive that the uh, listeners will send back either emails or, or text. So there's different different varieties of online. If you see a course is online, you have to investigate. Does that mean uh, audio conference call? Does it mean video conference? Does it mean a, a webcast? One way. Uh, th th there's different varieties, um, but okay. I'm glad. I'm glad it was uh, uh, satisfying for you. And um, you know, I love video conferencing. I, I have been I have been working with it for I don't know maybe 25, 30 years now. And uh, you know, it's it's my it's part of my the name of my personal website: storytelling and video conferencing. If I ever put out a book of my writings, the name of the book will be Storytelling and Video Conferencing. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, I feel that when, um, when you get a conversation going, you forget uh, if, it's, uh, if the person is, is, is uh, in the same room with you or, or by video mm -hmm. conference. And actually, for the, for, the, for the people in my room, uh, in our room, we are communicating both yeah. eye to eye uh, uh, and yeah. also electronically. Because if we look at the screen, we see each other's image. But then if we look above the yeah. screen, we see each other directly. So we are having a, 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 double, a double communication. <laughs> yes, yes. OK, and anyone else want to say anything? Well, we're still recording. So does anyone want to say anything uh, before we stop recording, or should we just stop recording? A great experience, Dr. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. great experience for me, and uh, really enjoyed all these sessions. Uh, it was very informative, and we learned a lot through this. And I learned a lot also in storytelling and how to write and things like that, because it's the first time I'm getting into this, and uh, uh, I had a lot of lovely people with me. Yeah, too, so. I like meeting the people. Mm -hmm. I like to listen to everyone. Even thank Dr. Eric. Hey, oh, uh, wait a minute! Please, uh, please don't please don't. Uh, don't give me the doctor title every time. Uh, <laughs> that's enough. It's enough doctor title for today. But uh, go, uh, Hema, please go ahead. I think she's frozen now. The image. Yeah, she's frozen. Yeah, I'm to everyone like Anupurna Vani. So uh, it was a pleasant experience for me that one Sunday uh, where we relax and uh, get held up with the family chores. But it is a different experience for me and this is my first online course. I would like to uh, love to do further. Uh, that is the uh, outcome yeah. of this uh, storytelling yeah. workshop. Uh, thank you, Erika, and also everyone for your uh, co-participant participation. And yeah. She's no. breaking. Yeah. Uh, oh. Eric, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. No, I just said uh, now I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording, uh, but we can can still continue talking for a moment. Okay.